All right. I think we're we're about ready to kick on with our first startup stories of 2021. Very excited to deliver to, to deliver this with you all and Lockie as well. So welcome everyone to the Integrated Innovation Network's Startup Stories with Lockie Gray of Yano. My name is Richard and I'm the program coordinator at the University of Newcastle's Integrated Innovation Network or I2N. So before we jump into our event, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this virtual event from the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all joining us from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. You can also show your respect and awareness of the country you are joining us from by letting us know in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. That chat function is also where you can connect and comment on, uh, with others on the event. For those of you who are new to the I2N, we're an initiative of the University of Newcastle and have a central aim of being a catalyst for regional transformation through enterprise skill development, new venture creation and entrepreneurship. At the heart of the I2N is a strategically positioned entrepreneurship center in Newcastle CBD, offering incubation facilities that are complemented by a series of connection events like this this morning and cohort-based programs covering individual enterprise skill development, pre-startup creation, new venture establishment and acceleration, and innovation development for existing SMEs. All industry sectors are supported, extending beyond the traditional tech-based startups to include social innovation and creative industries. And in just under four years of operation and with the support of New South Wales, New South Wales Government's Boosting Business Innovation Program, the I2N has welcomed more than 4,000 innovators and entrepreneurs from a range of industries and sectors at any stage of their journey and regardless of their affiliation with the university. We have helped fuel, grow and graduate more than 70 businesses and they've raised over $6 million in funding and have fostered the creation of dozens of jobs and work integrated learning opportunities for students. They've acquired customers, won awards, grown their teams and developed products and solutions that are delivering real world impact. The I2N is recognized as having a leading and unique capacity to act as a connector and enabler of entrepreneurship and innovation within the Hunter region, utilizing the skills of experienced and skilled program developers, facilitators, mentors, and coaches. If you'd like to know more, you can head to our website at newcastle.edu.au slash I2N. So a little outline on the format of this morning's event. We've taken a number of questions from attendees like you this morning at registration, and we'll be leading with those after our speaker provides a brief background on their startup journey. Then we'll open it up to any questions that you've been asking via the Zoom Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen and is different to your chat function. One good thing about virtual events is that I don't need to point you to the bathrooms or fire exits. If you're at your home, you should probably know the drill by now. Our guest this morning is Lockie Gray, MD and co-founder of Yano an online learning platform that helps medium to large businesses with distributed teams get staff on the same page faster. Lockie and the Yano team believe that being distributed shouldn't be a barrier and clear and consistent communication and their customers agree too. They work with leading brands such as Woolworths, Tal Insurance and Super Cheap Auto. Lockie also happens to be a recent transplant from Sydney, having decided last year that Newcastle was the place for him to live and grow his venture. Welcome Lockie this morning, and thank you for taking the time to join us at Startup Stories. Thank you very much, Rich. Great to be here. I'll just start to share my screen. Yep. All right. Can you see the big green screen? Looking good from here. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks Javon, thank you, Rich. I'm really grateful for the opportunity uh, to chat to you all this morning. And thank you to everybody watching uh, for starting your day with Startup Stories. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a husband and a dad of two kids. And as Rich said, we recently moved from Sydney to beautiful Newcastle. I don't know why we didn't do it sooner, but don't hold that against me, please. Uh, I love electric stuff. We've got an electric bike um, that I ride the kids to school in, got an electric skateboard as well. Um, but my dream is to retrofit a, a Defender to run on batteries. And uh, we have to visualize the win, right? So my Yano journey has been incredibly rewarding and challenging. The roller coaster ride has forced me to 
develop a bunch of coping strategies to manage the stress and responsibility of guiding a brand new business with no map to follow and with a young family to provide for. And some of the most valuable wisdom I've received so far is to share experience rather than advice. And I don't know about you, but when we were starting out with Yano, everyone we spoke to gave us advice on what we should be doing. And I found this a bit challenging since I had no idea what I was doing. So the advice could be helpful or not. How did I know? So this morning, I'd like to share parts of my story, what I've learned along the way, in the hope that you walk away from this session with at least one idea or, or action. And I learn by reading. So I'll also share some books that have inspired me over the past few years. So six years ago, my good mates and now business partner, Mark and I, were on a chairlift in Japan. We were both working in digital at the time. Mark was working as a sales guy slash digital producer for his own digital agency. And I was working as an executive digital producer, which is just a digital project manager for a medium sized digital agency. And we were talking about the miscommunication that we'd see daily between the agency and the clients about that, what they were getting in their website projects. So we thought, let's solve it by creating an online course about digital skills. And over the next 18 months, we shot 10 short videos and built a learning platform to deliver them. Our target market were digital agencies. So we built a landing page to get some feedback from them on our first video. And we asked them, is the digital skills gap an issue for you? And they said, absolutely. We said, great. Would you pay to show the videos to your clients? And they said, no way. And we said, well, why? And they said, well, who are we to tell our clients what they do and don't know? Most of them think they know everything. And this was crushing for us. We left our jobs. We both had young families. And the idea that we'd spend 18 months working on died overnight. which leads me to my second learning, research the market. So Mark and I mistakenly assumed that if we were experiencing this pain, then everyone else must be too, that we were the market. And this proved to be incorrect in our case. So what to do? We read a ton of books, such as Lean Startup and Running Lean, to learn how other people had done it. And off the back of those, we set up interviews with over 100 learning and HR professionals to ask them about their roles, what success looked like, what the barriers were to achieving that success. And then we set up two free pilots to get real life feedback from potential customers. And based on their feedback, we created Yano as it is today, an online learning company that helps medium to large businesses quickly upskill staff who work remotely. So we craft questions based on what learners encounter every day and we create concise explanations of key concepts with relevant articles. So the idea is that it's very light touch and it can be done in just a couple of minutes each day. So we work with customers in Australia in three major industry groups, logistics and supply chain, retail and finance and insurance. We have the most customers in logistics and supply chain and the highest value customer in retail. And many of our customers have workforces distributed all throughout the country. And many of their staff are deskless, such as truck drivers, distribution center workers and retail staff. And it can be difficult to communicate need to know information out to these staff in a timely way. And then to get insight into what they do and don't know. I mean, in many of these environments, there are consequences if things go wrong, such as safety, financial, reputational. So these are the pain points that we collaborate with our customers to solve. And our goal is to help our customers change their employees' behavior, to get them to do something different. Now, this is aspirational. It's not always achievable and, and it's difficult to measure, but we strive for it nonetheless. So our goal by 2024 in three years time is to reach 100,000 paid learners on the platform, which is roughly five times where we are now. And this chart here shows you from the beginning um, our learner growth. So you can see it's pretty, pretty slow and then really spiked here. And that big increase in April 2019 was when our largest customer, Super Retail Group, joined. They own Super Cheap Auto, Rebel Sports, MacPack, and BCF. 
So they doubled our learners in revenue overnight, which was fantastic, but brought with it a few challenges as well. Which leads me to learning number three, that as a founder, I always seem to be doing things for the first time, even now, five years in. In April, 2019, we were asking, how do we price a contract that's seven times larger than anything we've done before? Will our platform hold up? Will our customer support hold up? And our approach back then, and still is today, to ask a lot of questions, to write down our desired outcome, our assumptions. We do a pre-mortem and we ask what could go wrong. We ask what are the possible outcomes and how certain are we that they'll occur? And then we back ourselves. And I actually think that as knowledge workers, you know, our currency is decisions. So the more we can invest in leveling up our decision-making ability, the better, since I think those benefits will compound over time. And one of the best things I've done for my decision-making is to use a decision journal. And I put an example here from Farnham Street. I find that writing down what's in my head brings clarity and can highlight areas of the decision that I need to dig further into. You know, I list out my assumptions, what I think will happen. And then I come back six months later, once the outcome is known to see how accurate I was. And we use the decision journal at Yano as well to empower anyone to make a decision. So some of the de decisions the team made last year were whether we hire a customer support role to stop using time tracking software, whether we work with a customer in a particular industry, whether we stop uh, using Google display ads. So we've really tried to run our own race from the beginning. We're bootstrapped. So we're self-funded, whether rightly or wrongly. So we live or die based on how well we solve our customers' needs. Yet, we can also make our own decisions and grow at our own pace. And we really invest in our people and how we communicate with each other. Each month, we practice giving and receiving feedback as a team. You know, we've done that for five years now. We regularly praise each other in our thanks Slack channel and at the start of each Monday's team whip. We're really proud of our brand personality and we do things that don't scale such as investing in a high touch customer success and content creation model. Uh, investors typically don't like it, but our customers do. So what would a chat be uh, about a startup be without some mention of money? So here you can see our year on year revenue from 2017 to 2020. The average year on year growth rate over that time is 82%. Now, of course, that's an average, and you can see that some years were much higher than this and some were lower. And if you look to the right of the chart here, you can see that the growth required to achieve our 2024 $10 million in recurring revenue goal is 71% year on year, which is actually 11% below what we've done in the past five years, which is not to say that reality will match this forecast. In fact, the one thing I can be certain about is that it absolutely won't. Which leads me to learning number four. So while the revenue growth looks strong, we still had our dips along the way. And they, the beauty of averages is they smooth out a lot of troughs. So we grew too quickly in mid 2019 and we had to make two, Yana was redundant. They were some of the toughest moments for me sitting across the table from someone that I'd sold the vision to and having to tell them that unfortunately we couldn't keep them on. And I learned that making hard choices is hard and doing it with compassion and kindness is key. And I think people appreciate knowing where they stand all along the journey with its inevitable ups and downs. We've worked from home a few days a week since 2016. When Yano started, we actually all worked a four day week, something I'd done in my previous role, but we found it was too difficult to mentally take the day off when we had no revenue coming in. Since March last year, we've been fully remote after giving up our sublease in North Sydney. And I look to people with experience working remotely for guidance, such as Matt Mullenweg, the WordPress founder and CEO of Automatic, who has a 1300 person remote business. And initially when we went fully remote, I tried to replicate the office environment online with lots of meetings, everyone online at the same time. But now I'm asking myself, well, how do we embrace the remote environment where not everyone needs to be online at the same time? can we get to the point where Yanoas can work seamlessly with each other across time zones? So now we're experimenting with asynchronous meetings where we collaborate on and discuss the meeting notes prior and ask, do we even need a meeting? 
And we're also doing interviewing remotely, which has led to unexpected benefits, such as being able to record the interview for other Yarnamas to watch in their own time. And this is a screenshot from an interview that we did a few weeks ago. We acknowledge that the social connection is really important to healthy relationships and our well-being. So we do quarterly team offsites and we organize regular in-person catch-ups as well. And speaking of well-being, that brings me to my final learning for today, which is that I've learned that my mental fitness needs the same focus that I've always put on my physical fitness. And to help me navigate the uncertainty and stress, I've met with counsellors a few times. I really love this format because it's an independent third party who asks me questions with no judgment or agenda. And I find it really helps me to dig into my underlying assumptions and beliefs and really interrogate them. And often when they're brought into the spotlight, they lose some of their intensity. I find talking with other founders and business owners really helpful and especially meeting them regularly since I've learned that there's always someone at the top of the roller coaster and at the bottom and each month our positions on the roller coaster will change. And that's really normalized what can be a really stressful and an uncertain journey. I look to the Stoics as well, who were Roman philosophers writing about human behavior and shenanigans over 2000 years ago to help identifying what is and isn't in my control so that I can spend my energy focusing on things that are in my control since there are plenty that aren't. And I like reading and listening to people such as Tara Brock, a meditation teacher and psychologist who communicates with wisdom, compassion and, and humor. And I think it's important as founders and business owners that we look out for each other and, and, and really support each other. And finally, I love my job. I get to ride the highs and lows with an exceptional bunch of people and I hope you do too. And I'm always happy to connect with like-minded people. LinkedIn is probably the best place to catch me. Thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Lockie. That was, that was excellent. Very well thought out and very well presented. Um, the illustrations, did you have the whole team illustrated? Yeah, so that's something that we've done right from the start. We have a children's book illustrator in Italy, Bruno, um, who illustrates all our characters uh, all our customers, um, though he works on Italian time. So uh, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, having team, team members around the world, is, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it seems that you guys are very well positioned to, to deal with that. So anyway, um, let's jump into the questions. You did mention quite a few things, um, especially some cool resources like Thinking in Bets. That's been tossed around here at the Hub a few times. Um, I know Siobhan's a huge fan of the Knowledge Project on Bar Barnum Street. So it's one of uh, Rahul from the University of Newcastle, who's a student here, has asked, starting a new business is very unpredictable, which is why many individuals prefer working in full-time jobs. How can an aspiring entrepreneur handle this uncertainty? And is it tools like what you've presented today that helped you, or is it something else or something more? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Rahul. And it's something that I reflect on a lot. And I've come to realize that a significant part of my journey has been learning how to manage uncertainty. I'm one of those people who actually finds peace in certainty. So on paper, terrible entrepreneur. Um, but in my experience, what's helped me has been to understand how that uncertainty manifests itself, you know, what triggers it, and to really identify what's in my control and what's out of my control, and to really plan for the worst and hope for the best. And as I mentioned, I find the decision journal helps a lot. So just the, the process of writing things down, of extracting them from my brain onto paper, that really helps me a lot. And if I'm super stuck, I'm talking to someone who I trust um, or who has experience and who has been there, I find that helpful as well. But it's a journey that I'm still on myself. Great answer, Lockie. It's, it's a constant learning experience that the path of learning never ends right so zara who's a phd student at the uni of sydney has said i have many ideas for solutions but don't quite know where to start what first steps should i take if i want to found my own company yeah great question zara so um as i shared uh we had a solution as well um so and it, and it didn't really fly so i found running lean a fantastic resource. Ash Mora um, has built a whole ecosystem around it. He has a lean canvas to help 
which is similar to a business model canvas where you lay out your business model and your idea on one page. But it really gets you thinking about who the customer is, what's their pain point, are they going to pay to solve it, and what's the fastest and cheapest way for you to test um, the assumptions that you're making. And so we really lent on that. And I have to say, in the Running Lean book, they're really practical examples. Like there are email scripts in there for how to approach people that you, you've never met before and ask them for a meeting. And we found it worked really well. People were very generous with us because we weren't selling anything. We were, we were asking for their advice. Uh, and what they actually said was that it was really rare for anyone to ask them how they're going in their job. So for them, it was almost a cathartic process. So that's what worked for us. That's such a great point. Um, the, the, the Running Lean resources, the, the, the Lean Startup by Eric, they're, they're fantastic resources. And it's something that, that, that we really, really believe in and push here at the I-20 University of Newcastle. We have a program called Validator, um, which we run twice a year. And we take in cohorts of teams and we have them going out and figuring out what the questions they want to ask us, what the market is, and asking those questions to potential customers, partners, investors, whatever that may be, whoever they identify. And it's such a powerful experience coming back 10 weeks later and seeing the overall change in the team's ideas, the, the way the team are, the way they, they, they talk to each other and their customers, and where they see themselves going in the next 6, 12, 18 months. Mm. That's, that's their really handy resources. Thanks, Lockie. Um, Akbar, who's a PhD student at the Uni of Newcastle, has asked, and you've actually grappled with two, two problems, Lockie, um, so I think you're very well positioned to answer this one. Did you always know you wanted to start your own company? And were you actively looking for an opportunity to solve a problem? So were you, were you at the agency thinking, God, I want to start something, where, where do I go next? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question, Akbar. Um, so to answer the first question, did I know I wanted to start my own company? No, I didn't actually. I was very happy being a salaried employee, working four days a week. I was very comfortable. So in hindsight, um, I, I was bored. I was bored. And, and that was the, the catalyst um, for me to start thinking about doing my own thing. And it was through conversations over many years with Mark, my business partner, that really led to us starting Yano. Um, and I guess at the culmination of those few years, yeah, we probably were looking for an opportunity to solve a problem. So we knew that we had the digital skills, we wanted to do something, build something online, but we didn't know what, what it would be. And we're fortunate that by going through that running and lean um, process, that really identified the problem for us. And we thought, oh, great, we can solve this. We're also lifelong learners, both of us. Um, so you know, learning uh, is something that's really important to us. And so I got to dive into well, learning research and learning science. And I learned things that I wish I had knew, known at uni and school you know, about how we learn. And a lot of those principles that we've incorporated into the platform today. Yeah, that's that's a, a great segue into speaking a bit more about the technology and the and the philosophy behind what, it, what the Yano product is. So Lucas Hakewell at SSE has asked, is your product an LMS? And if so, what is your experience selling an LMS platform in the B2B space? Mm, good question, Lucas. Yeah, so for those who are not familiar, um, an LMS is a learning management system. Um, very common, they've been around since the, the 70s. And typically they're a very large, do all the things platform once they're in very hard to get them out they they focus on your know, thousands of users and in my from my perspective very much focused on learner enrollment and completion you know what what we call vanity metrics so we've really tried to focus more on performance and aligning learning outcomes in yano with business outcomes um, and so we really focus on engagement and performance and then ideally behavior change off the back of it, which in my experience, um, I don't see learning management systems doing. But the other thing is we've tried to really focus on doing one or two things really well, rather than having say 30 or 40 features. Um, of course, customers ask for them um, and it's really difficult to, to say no, um, but we've tried to be very, very specific on what we do. And, and to answer the second part of the question about sales, um, it's really, hard B2B sales is hard um, 
my business partner, Mark, he's the sales guy. So he's probably got more gray than I. This is, all this gray is from Yano. Um, the sales cycle can be really long, like 18 months to more than two years in some cases. So when you're self-funded, um, that's an extremely long time. Lots of different stakeholders. So over time, we've learned that we really need to try and get in at the top. So C-level, heads of department, because if the referral comes down, top, top down, we're far more likely um, to have a chance at success. And we invested in a sales coach early on. We still work with him today. We've got a really defined sales process. We invest a lot in content marketing, like really trying to understand who are the buyers, where do they hang out, what's important to them, and how can we build you know, trust um, and uh, reputation with those people um, but yeah, it's a, it's a slog for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, just on the behavioral change, Glenn Downey, who's the director of the multi, multi, multi group and one of our valued BMS mentors has asked how deep into the behavioral change learning arc can Yano go? For example, it's one thing to communicate information to staff, another thing for staff to acknowledge, internalize and act on that information. Can you personalize testing of learning transfer, transfer for example? Yeah, it's a great question, Glenn. Something that we think about um, every day I mean, behavior change is aspirational and it's difficult to measure. Um, so in the beginning, we, coming from a digital background, you know, everything's measured and we made the assumption that learning would be the same and that is incorrect. Um, we've really tried to craft our content creation approach towards um, that outcome of shifting behaviors, but there are a lot of variables involved. So we workshop with our customers, the behaviors that they'd like to see in their staff. You know, we ask them what's blocking those behaviors currently. And then we really try to understand, well, what behaviors can be shifted with knowledge and understanding. And to your point, yeah, knowledge and understanding is only one point, um, one part of the, the learning process. Um, it needs to be put in place, it needs to be coached, it needs to be feedback. So we really rely on, on our customers to help us with that um, and you know, how they will measure success. And we have varying degrees of success in, in doing that. Um, some of our customers uh, measure a lot of different things. They're very close to their staff um, and they know that if they change this variable here and they see a change here, then there's probably a correlation. You know, causation is super difficult. We, we would never say, well, Yano is the thing that, that has caused that behavior change, but typically there is a fairly strong correlation. It's still something that, that we're working on. It's an ongoing conversation that we're having because we think it's, it's super important as a learning tool to be changing behavior. Your customers and clients, do they want to change, constantly change or periodically change what it is that they're optimizing for with your product, with, with the learnings of their team and their staff? And is that, is it difficult when that arises for your team and for yourself? Or is that just something that you roll with and just do? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. So usually in the first 12 months of an engagement, we'll set up some foundational um, content. So, you know, for a, for a transport company, for example, there might be a couple of key processes that they really want to embed with their drivers to keep the drivers safe, to keep the community safe. Um, and then over time, they'll start to add in additional layers over the top. Um, so we built Yana, one reason why it's a quiz based platform um, is because we heard from, from those 100 interviews that there was a lot of content that was locked up in long e learning modules, which are, which are great, but they can get out of date really fast, and then it can be hard to update them. So by, by using a Q question answer explanation format, it's really light, can be changed quickly. And that was one of our big goals that our customers could edit or create and edit content themselves. Um, some want to do that. So our goal over time is to get them fully up and running with Yano. They create their own content. We're just there in a support capacity. However, some don't. They've got a million other things to do in their day that don't want to be creating content. And so that's why we've invested in a customer success and, and content teams um, to, to go on that journey with them, to meet with the subject matter experts, to extract all that content out, what are the learning outcomes, what are the business outcomes, what are the behaviors and create new content. So it's definitely an, an evolving, ongoing conversation that we have. 
I'm getting to understand more what you mean when you say that Yano is a very hands-on company. <laughs> Your team is very close to the customer. It's, it's making more and more sense as, as I hear more. So Jaden Watt, who's a grad engineer at the Uni of Newcastle, has asked, did your own background in psychology inform your idea of good communication within teams? How is that integrated within the Yano platform? Mm. Great question, Jaden. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I would say it's my interest in psychology and human behavior and how we think that's informed my approach. To be honest, I didn't take a huge amount away from my time at uni and doing psychology. It was mainly stats and, and learning about facts. So what I've learned is, is more so about or from observing how other people communicate. Um, I've read a lot. I try and I seek training in it. I look to mentors for help on it. I think communicating with context is really important, um, especially for distributed and remote teams. And that's one of the big focuses of our platform, but also how we communicate with each other at, at Yano. And the uh, last year moving fully remote um, kind of forced us to create what we call a Yano, a handbook, um, which outlines how we communicate with each other, what we expect of each other, and goes down to detail with the different tools that we use. So Slack, for example, um, we use it every day it's great for some specific things, but context can be a casualty in our experience in Slack. And so we talk about, well, what's the point there where if you feel like you're talking past each other, there's a lot of back and forth on one topic, what point do you pick up the phone and say, hey, I think we're talking past each other here. Um, tell me more about your position. I'll tell you mine and then we can align and, and go forward together. And I think I probably learned yeah, I've, I've learned more from the school of life um, and reading people like Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's investment partner. I try and look for people who are cross discipline um, rather than going too specific in one. And, and he's a fantastic resource. He's actually um, mentioned often on uh, Farnham Street. I think Siobhan shared a link there earlier. Yeah, you're totally right. He is a fantastic resource. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk a bit more about the business side of Yano. Could you talk a bit to the difficulties that an early stage startup with little to no financial backing has when starting up? Yeah, sure. Um, many. <laughs> uh, for us, cash was king. Um, there was a period of time where you know, we could survive until the money ran out. We didn't pay ourselves for 18 months. So there's immense pressure to make the right decisions with limited time, limited information, limited capital. Um, the margin for error is extremely small. So if I knew that what I know now, would I still do it? I don't know. And that's an, that's an honest answer. Um, so for, for us, it's, well, for me, it's been about managing the uncertainty and really finding the balance, I guess, between delusion and determination, which is the classic entrepreneur's bet, like backing yourself, to, to, to focus on those areas where you think there is an opportunity, but being realistic with the feedback. And as we said before, that's where running lean is super helpful. You go out to a bunch of potential customers and you ask them some questions and those answers really inform. And it's like, oh, I, don't, I think we're missing the mark here. I don't think we're on, we're just, we're just not on the right spot. Um, so yeah, in my experience, it's tough. And I have to say as well, you know, I, I thought in those early days that was that was hard. And when we grew and we started making revenue, it would be far easier. Also not true um, because now I feel like we've got more to lose. And now I'm making decisions on behalf of 12 other people and their and their families. So it's just the challenges have, have shifted. Hey, you've mentioned on your team, you've mentioned that you give you've got tools that give your team a little bit more responsibility in their day-to-day -day activities. Can you explain a bit more about that and the, the, the hierarchy that your business is sort of aiming for and aspiring to? Yeah, sure. So um, we, we read a book called Reinventing Organizations, which is similar to Good to Great, if anyone's read that, but it's by a French author, which is really refreshing. So it's not American centric. And he basically looks at organizations, um, most of them are European, who, has, who have self-managed teams. So there's no one at the top. There's not a, it's not a traditional top-down hierarchy where the person up the top makes the decrees and everyone else just follows them. Um, 
And we've tried to incorporate self-managed teams at Yano. We've been doing it for well, probably almost two years now. So it's a very flat structure. And when I thought about it, I thought, why does that top-down hierarchy exist? I mean, there, there are lots of reasons, but you know, one of the, the main ones is I think there's a lack of trust um, in people to, to do the right thing. And there's also asymmetry in information in that the people at the top have all the information. And then as you go down the pyramid, it goes less and less and less. So I think it's really hard for the, the people on the ground to make decisions because they don't have information and they're not trusted. So we said, well, we trust our staff. Let's give them the information so they can make their own decisions. So we've been doing that yeah, for, for a couple of years now. So we share all our financial information. The, the team know exactly where we're at, what our challenges are, what our risks are, what's working well. And we have tools like the decision template. So anybody can write a decision template um, and they can ask for feedback, but it's ultimately on them to make that decision. And um, I think that's been fantastic. The team has, has given me that feedback um, that they feel empowered. They have that ownership and the autonomy um, to make their own decisions. And it really levels up everybody's decision-making as well, because we are writing things down. We can all return back to them. So when a new yarn over starts and they can say, hey, um, why did we stop using Google Display Ads? We can go back and read it and you can read the assumptions um, behind it and why we made that decision. So it's really interesting though, as we grow, I'm thinking how does self-managed teams work you know, as we grow? Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm actively working on as well. Thanks for delving into that, Lockie. It's always fascinating to hear about companies who are, who are going for that flat organisation structure. Uh, Liam from, from Nui Tech People has asked, you've got a lot of experience with remote onboarding. Do you have any recommendations to organisations and hiring managers who are struggling with betting remote resources into largely on-premises teams? Yeah. Hey, Liam. Um, I think remote onboarding is challenging. Um, you know, trying to build rapport and get a sense of who's who's virtually is difficult, um, especially in that hybrid environment that you've described there, where you have, let's say, most of the people um, together in an office, say, and then a few people virtual. I actually think that's one of the hardest models personally. Uh, I know for us, when we were doing it, um, yeah, you have everyone sitting in a room, they're laughing, chatting, and then the people virtually, you sort of... You sort, of, well, uh, uh, and it, you sort of just stay stay quiet, and, and you just removed you're once removed from that connection. So, for us, like planning before a new Yanoma starts helps a lot. Um, we found that remote onboarding requires more planning than usual, especially for tangible things like laptops and keyboards that they need to have prior to day one. So we need to have sent those out, you know, at least a week before. And we start with a what we call a pre-boarding campaign in Yano. So a week before they start, um, they receive a campaign to introduce them to the team, to our values and to some of our systems so that they have a, some foundation before day one. Um, we sign a buddy to each new starter who's responsible for checking in with them and making them feel welcome. And this may seem ironic, but we also try to do an in-person um, catch up. And that's actually something that I've discovered a lot of fully remote businesses do is they catch up in person at the start because to build that connection and the rapport, I think it's just super important to be able to meet face to face and do that. Um, so that was our plan for our newest starters a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, I had to cancel that because of what was happening with, with COVID. So we moved it all online. Um, but yeah, it, it is something that we're still working on ourselves as well. Yeah, that's, that, that's a great point about you can have a distributed team, but it's important to meet face to face and get that, that, that physical interaction. We have a few teams, at, so at the right when we have a few incubation spaces. Um, I'm at the one on Hunter Street today, and we have some teams who run their teams both in the hub, some are external, some are other sides of the world. But at some point, they always get together. For the ones that are closer, they'll get together on a Friday afternoon and they'll be at the hub or somewhere else in Newcastle. Other times, it'll be quarterly but it does happen and it is important. So Al Northam of Little Hubs has asked, what has been the growth trajectory of Yano since the beginning and what strategy have you found works best for your growth? I know that you touched on what the trajectory is in your intro, but do you know what works best for your company? Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess 
I would say the growth's been slow and steady um, with lots of ups and downs along the way. Um, Mark, my business partner, from a sales perspective, would say lumpy um, and, and challenging. Um, I think for us, growth has been about really understanding the customer um, and the buyers um, and talking to them in their language and making it clear that we understand their world, their pain points, how we can solve them, then understanding where they hang out and trying to build a strong relationship with them there. Because we're B2B, um, we focus a lot on LinkedIn. Um, over the last 12 months or so, we've really focused on our content marketing. So um, on recording videos, blog posts, um, and really getting out there regularly um, and trying to use the, the customer's language and get their feedback as well. Like what's resonating, what's not resonating, what are their objections, how can we talk to those? How can we add value in lots of different ways? Um, and we find it helpful to view things as an experiment um, so that we learn from them um, and we're not too attached you know, to an idea. Uh, we, for example, we spent some time on Instagram for a while. Um, it just didn't work for us. You know, it, it just wasn't a great platform for us to reach B2B um, customers. So that was an experiment and um, we wrote it up didn't fly we learned from it and now we focus on on linkedin and that's where the, that thinking in bets book that i mentioned in the presentation i found that super helpful um thinking in bets so is, is similar to an experiment you know there's there's a probability of a successful outcome and it's trying to think through understanding what that probability is um, and then either going for it or not but not getting too hung up on it so it's that constant cycle of experimentation and learning and having multiple experiments out there and getting the feedback it's 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 it's, great. it's, it's so valuable for, for companies and product testers to, to to really push everything forward and get the greatest insights right. what's your feedback loop and how quickly can you get that completed hmm. um let's shift into challenge management with Yano. malika has asked who's a university of Newcastle student what are the unique features of Yano that keep it standing out from your competition and do you have any advice for founders building their products and brand who want to get noticed? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question, Malika. Um, so from my perspective and from what I've heard from our customers, you know, it's our focus on customer success and, and really trying to understand what the customer values. So um, we're a, probably a higher price, you know, lower volume model as opposed to a lower price, high volume model. Um, that a lot of our competitors are. And that's quite interesting. It's a real fork in the road. So for us, um, that means that yeah, there are less customers, um, but we have more time to spend with them and we're really trying to tailor content to them. So for our customers, they really value that. That's what they want. Um, and I think it's our personality and brand as well. Um, as I mentioned in the Prezzo, you know, we've, we really tried to run our own race from the start and stay stay true to that. Um, and probably, you know, the slow growth uh, for us it has been helpful because it's meant that we haven't been forced or pushed down any particular paths. We've taken that experimentation mindset and, um, you know, pull back if we feel like we need to change direction and we've been able to do that. Um, but I think to, to, to your second point around building their product and brand, um, again, I think it's really about understanding the customers, where they hang out, what's important to them and being there and being there a lot until they start saying, geez, I, what, I keep, this business keeps coming up. There, there must be something to it. And I think there's an element of social proof there that we try and do that a lot as well. Yeah, always being in front of, so that at that right time with the right decision maker, they're there ready to make the deal. Yeah, because just to that point rich because the sales cycle for us is so long it's not as though yeah, they're going to see a display ad and say oh, let's go and buy yano so for us it's actually about building that trust over a really long period of time so yeah by the time oh we we need a new learning performance tool oh hold on doesn't doesn't yano do that okay let's start that conversation so yeah it's a bit like fishing with a really really long line yeah absolutely a bit of deep sea fishing for those yeah. big catches so this, this moves well into Liam, Liam Potter's next question. 
He's asked in the Q&A section, where do you think the bulk of your growth will come from for the next three to four years? You've, you've outlined some really hefty goals. Well, how do you think your team will achieve it, if at all? Yeah, it's a really good question, Liam. And this is something that we spoke about in our recent um, team strategy session that we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're, we're really focusing on, on partnerships. Um, so we have a few partners, um, but what we're really trying to do now is say, well, who's already serving our customers? Um, and let's see if we can partner with them where there's a mutual benefit. And I think that's going to be one of the main, main channels for us to be realistic, um, to, to, to grow our learners by five times. Um, what we're also seeing is that, and I think it's Jim Collins in, in Good to Great who talks about the flywheel, you know, this big wheel, it's so slow to move at the start. There's no inertia. It can feel like you're just pushing this huge rock uphill. That's slowly starting to change. So now that we're working with super retail group, then other larger retailers are like, oh, okay, maybe we should look at Yano as well. So there's definitely that, that social proof element that I think will help. Um, and we've invested in a second salesperson for the first time recently. He's down in Melbourne. Um, and he's very much focused on, on the, the logistics and supply chain sector. Um, so, and in particular electric vehicles, which is really exciting. So I guess there's potentially new industries um, that, that, that will open up over time as well, like, like electric vehicles um, that we can be a part of. So we're still actively exploring exactly how we're going to do it. And in some ways you could say, well, that's a bit, isn't that a bit crazy to, to set this hugely aspirational goal and not know how we're going to get there? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, but uh, what I've found over the last couple of years is that that's what really drives us as a team to say, this is where we want to be. Now let's work out how we're going to get there. And that's for the whole team to work out. And that's going to change and evolve as new Yanawas come on, as new customers come on as well. So it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, really practicing what you preach, preach with the uh, thinking in bets and, and living in those two, two head spaces of the typical founder. So speaking to the, the recent salesperson you onboarded in Melbourne, how have you balanced the roles you've needed in your business over time? And what did you do if skill gaps weren't filled? Mm, um, yeah, a lot of juggling and luck, I think. You know, we've always been a lean business. Uh, we're a small business, so everyone wears many hats. Um, I think you have to really want to work in an environment like that. So for the right person, that's really rewarding and stimulating since no two days are the same and you have a ton of autonomy to do things your own way. Um, we've really been led, I guess, by where the gaps are, um, where the pain is, where the constraints are. Um, and then we've, we've sort of fi filled them as we're going. Um, so when we identify a skills gap, we see if anyone in the team has a skill or can we get upskilled? Can we upskill ourselves? So can someone do a course, you know, extract all the information out and go back and teach the team? Um, we use that model often. Um, if not, we just, we list, them, list those skill gaps out, prioritize them, and then try and work towards hiring the relevant person, you know, as soon as, as it's practical. Um, yeah, the, 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 we hold off a long time to hire the second salesperson. Um, so, it feels really good to be to be doing it um and it's an experiment as well um so this first time we've really invested in customer acquisition at the front to really support mark which will probably change the nature of the, how the lead generation works through the business as well which will inform other hires in the future so yeah it's, it's always changing yeah it's just more feedback to work on to move forward on your, yeah. your projections and goals yeah definitely yep. Um, John has mentioned, has said, great session. Um, Lockie, you touched on mind training and meditation, which is something I've also found to be largely, hugely beneficial and underestimated. Do you follow a daily routine for mind training meditation? And is this something you promote for your staff to do or just a personal strategy for yourself? Mm. Yeah, um, thanks, John. Yeah, I, so I'm a big fan of Sam Harris, um, the Waking Up app. So for those not familiar, um, he's a neuroscientist and philosopher, um, all around very, very smart guy. Uh, I feel very humble whenever I listen to him. So he has a meditation app. Um, he puts up new daily content. He also records podcasts with philosophers and thinkers, meditation teachers. I've learned a lot from that. Um, and 
uh, yeah, I try and do it every day. Um, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, but I've also focused a lot on my breathing um, and which I find I can do that at any point in the day. You know, just do some box breathing, five seconds in, hold for five, breathe out for five, hold for five. Just do that for a minute or two and I can do that at any point. And yeah, we, we do it as a team. So at the start of every team, we, we have two minutes of mindfulness and we do that um, so that to give us time to arrive at that meeting, you know, from the weekend. Um, often I find we come into a meeting, you're in a rush, you've got a million other things, your context switching, you come in, you're just not there. You're physically there, but you're mentally not there. So we try and use mindfulness as a way to help us arrive, to get in the same space. And even though we're doing it virtually, there's still some, there's some connection element about it, which I, I really like. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big uh, proponent of it. Yeah, thanks for digging that. That's a fantastic insight. I, I agree that the, the Sam Harris content, his podcast and his app, um, really helpful. I haven't used, I don't use them recently, but the podcast, especially I've dug into, is a huge, great resource for perspective that you don't really expect. Mm. Perspective you haven't experienced before. Mm. Um, Bill Oswald of AECI has asked, having the same materials doesn't necessarily deliver on consistent learning outcomes. How do you think the best way or what do you think the best way is to ensure consistent outcomes across a diverse and remote workforce yeah um that's a that's a really good question and, and it's a tricky one um i think you know the, the way that we approach it is to really try and at the start of every engagement is to dig into who the learners are what's their environment like what's important to them how are they being communicated with at the moment um like why should they do this learning? Why should they be interested in it? How's it going to benefit them in the long term? And are their team leads and managers supporting them in the learning? Because we know if they're not, if they don't have that support, then it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I think it's about getting regular feedback as well, like trying to create some feedback loops. Are the learners doing it? So what we find with our larger customers is, yeah, there might be some stores, for example, retail stores that are always consistently high performance and then there are some that aren't so then the question becomes okay well what's the difference why why is that going on and we work with our customers to try to explore that um, and sometimes it's as simple as yeah the manager's not interested or they're too busy or they're under resourced so why would we do this learning um, we just don't have time for it um, or it might be that they feel that the content isn't as relevant for them that's really good feedback for us and we've actually built into Yano a feature so that any learner can give us feedback on any single piece of content that's in there. And we give that back to the customers as well. Say, so, well, look, there's a bit of a theme here. So what we would recommend doing is revisiting this with a subject matter expert um, and with the people on the ground. Because what we found as well is there's what the training manual says or what the process is and what's actually happening on the ground. Those two things sometimes don't match. And that's okay. Like that's actually a really good insight and our customers value that. So um, we, we have that conversation, we rejig the learning, we try again, again, it's an, it's an ongoing process of feedback, experimentation, learning, and on it goes. Thanks so much for that insight. This, is, this, this entire segment, this entire event has been so great. And it's been so awesome to learn about a new startup doing in, in the region, doing very unique things and very cool hands-on things with their clients in their own way. Um, it's these, these opportunities to hear that at, at a bit more length is, is, is so, so valuable for us at the I2N and for the, for the startups in our incubator and for the region itself. So thanks, Lockie. Thanks so much this morning for, for dropping in. Um, thanks so much for sharing your story and really looking forward to hearing more about what you're doing in the future and how you can get involved more in, in what we're doing here. Thanks for we're, having um, me, Rich. That, that's okay. We're, um, we're nearing the end of our hour. Um, what I'll do is I'll just quickly share my screen before we, we pass off and jump into our, our Wednesday mornings. So we've got a couple of things coming up uh, this month and, and, and moving into the first half of the year. Ne our next Join the Dots event, which is our monthly networking event, will be focusing on illegals on IP. And this is an opportunity for founders, no matter what stage they're at, and business, business leaders, no matter what stage they're at and where they're working, to understand more about the legal landscape and how to protect your ideas. 
We've got some awesome speakers coming from different legal firms. We've got some awesome founders coming from different industries to talk about what they've done, the tools that they've implemented. You can register for that on our Eventbrite or on our socials. And that's happening later this month on the 24th of Feb here at I2N Hub Hunter Street and online if you can't make it to the hub. Next up, only a week after that, we'll have Trisha Martin joining us for Startup Stories. She's a, a Newcastle founder who started something called Virtual Intern. Now, last year, many students, um, high school students, weren't able to intern with, with, with businesses for, for um, obvious reasons. So she so, thought, I can solve this. I'll create a platform to link these students to these companies. And we'll... Um, and, and, we, and we'll get them their intern, we'll get them their time with the company, we'll get them their learnings. Uh, she'll be talking just like Lockie on Zoom um, on the 3rd of March. So get your, the tickets are available on the event right now and on our socials. And a really cool program, one, one of our mentors actually asked the question, we have a few in the audience with us this morning, uh, is VMS or Venture Mentor Service. This is a very unique team mentoring program where a venture will send in an EOI, um, describe themselves a bit, and we'll put that to our team of mentors, to our, to our cohort of mentors. And a few mentors will, will, will put their hands up and say, I'd love to work with that venture. And they'll come with you on your startup journey to work through the problems that you're having. So we take EOIs every month. EOIs are open now. You can just go to newcastle.edu.au slash VMS. And you can get access to some people who have done it before, who have been there and can understand things from your perspective and really help you take your venture to the very next level. Um, it's a fantastic program. It's, it's very bespoke and it's very valuable for any founders in the region. We're one of two universities in Australia to adopt this. Um, and it was originally created by MIT over in the US. And finally, I to a hub Honeysuckle. Some of you may have been down Honeysuckle Drive in Worth Place recently and seen this big timber glass building. That's, our, that's gonna be our home as of the middle of next this, this year. Um, it's a six star, green star rated. It's the first in the region of its kind. We'll have 84 desks, six offices, over two and a half square, thousand square meters of space, purpose built for you, the founder, to build your startup, utilizing all of the programs that we have on offer and utilizing all of the key um, assets that we have in the building for you to get to, to, to move on and grow and really uh, take your startup um, beyond the stage it's at now and get it to that next spot. So here's a look at from the ground floor. We have an event space. So events like this we're doing this morning, we'll be doing in the event space and also broadcasting out uh, to, to the world via Zoom. There's a seminar space for programs like um, uh, Validator and um, Navigator that I, I mentioned earlier. We'll be running these um, from this space. You can leave your stuff there. We'll have our facilitators working with you hands-on with your, with your product, with your teams um, to, to help grow. And then eventually, once you're there and ready, we have the co-working space at the top where you can work from either stand-up desks, sit-down desks, hot desks, or an office if you're at that spot where you, you need an office for your team. So if you need any more information, EOI is open now for the incubator at Honeysuckle. Uh, go to newcastle.edu.au slash incubator, send an EOI, get that timestamp, that, that, um, that dated application in. There's, no, there's, there's um, no strings attached, but it just gets you in line because desks are filling out fast. And that's it from us. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much for attending Startup Stories. If you have any questions, hit us up, iswen at newcastle.edu.au. Um, any information on any of our programs or events that are coming up, just reach out. We'd love to hear what you're doing and learn about more about what you're, um, where you're going. And finally, thank you again, Lockie. It's been fantastic and looking forward to seeing you more. Thanks everyone.